Hello, my name is Kjörg Gilosson. I'm going to be talking about my essay called Diagnosing the Past. One of the goals of writing an autobiography is exploring and locating one's social standing. The author tries to paint an accurate image of their character and their role in the world, or perhaps more accurately, the, their perception of the world. On that presumption, it must matter when one decides to take on such a task. Where the author is situated in the course of his life affects the narrative. In a very short time, a single event can dramatically alter one's opinions and even one's entire worldview. The same applies to how we look at the past. Our environment shapes how we interpret our memories, even if the sequence of events and the contents of the memory might not change, a formative event can alter the cadence or overtone of the narrative and its significance to the person remembering. In my autobiography, I want to look at and then analyze a couple of memories that have altered in their significance recently. When I was 20 years old, I was diagnosed with ADHD. The diagnosis surprised me and others that know me. Subsequently, I embarked on a journey of rediscovery. I had to learn about my diagnosis, how it affected me, and how I should rem remedy it. In this process, I had to change and, in some cases, get rid of old habits that had been formed over the years. Events that had proved formative in the past also had to be reconsidered. There were many lessons that had come under review. Most people can probably point to events from their past that had a formative effect on their character. In the course of our lives, we encounter all manners of challenges that we take on with various results. We also draw different conclusions from these challenges. When we subdivide the course of our lives, we usually place these formative events at the end of each chapter. As a person that has spent most of his life in educational institutions, I have to some degree been conditioned to segment my life, life's course after levels of education. I remember glimpses of life in kindergarten, my first days in elementary school, memory of my time in secondary school are still clear, junior college is fresh in memory, and finally my time here, at the Faculty of History and Philosophy at the University of Iceland. It goes without saying that different scales can be applied when examining one's life's course, but I feel the one I have just discussed fits well with the chosen subject and approach. I do not intend to go far into the science that explains the mental disorder that is ADHD. I will simply put forward a general characterization of the disorder and how it affects me. Common symptoms of ADHD are difficulty paying attention, excessive activity and brash behavior. These symptoms can often lead to poor performance in school. I believe I exhibited all these traits to a varied degree as a child. My primary problem is, is that it takes me on average a longer time to adopt new ideas and methods and put them to use. For some reason this did not affect me much in primary and secondary school. I could despite my slow processing rate keep up with the curriculum. This is probably one of the reasons I was not diagnosed earlier in life. When I got to junior college things got harder and my grades started to gradually fall. I still managed to graduate on time, though with lower grades than I had set my sights on. When I started university, I hit a wall. I felt that I felt was insurmountable, no matter how much I applied myself. This gave cause to a great deal of concern and a lot of speculation. I wondered what had caused this sudden collapse in academic performance. Was it school fatigue, lack of ambition, laziness, or was I just simply in over my head? It was at that moment that I decided to seek professional help and advice. Shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with ADHD. One of the reasons I decided to get examined was that my mother and two brothers had been diagnosed a couple of years before me. I had heard that ADHD could be her hereditary, and sure enough, I was diagnosed. It would seem that my case supports that theory. Still knowing all this, the diagnosis came as a shock to me and others. It revealed certain ideas and, to some extent, prejudices that I had about the disorder. In my mind, I had this stereotype of a person with ADHD that did not fit with how I saw myself. I believe that in many respects these ideas were, form were formed by discourse conventions that were practiced in my family for quite some time until members started getting diagnosed. I also think, this, think that my initial response to the diagnosis is a fairly common reaction. It is difficult to recognize information that might challenge basic presumptions about oneself. It has taken a lot of time and effort to process the new information about myself and I am nowhere near done in that regard. But I have made some progress. 
I have read books, taken courses, sought help from certified professionals, and got appropriate medication. As a result, I have managed to decrease my impairments. In this process, I have had to re-examine myself and lessons from the past and my limits. But it was not just my own memories that came to be re-evaluated. Because such a large portion of my family was diagnosed with this disorder, the family memory also came into revision. This is what I intend to explore further. I believe that this subject provides an interesting challenge for memory as a historical source. The revision takes place on my personal memory and family memory entails some interesting questions about the nature of memory in modern society. I have limited myself to a couple of avenues for analysis. First, I want to look at how the diagnosis altered the discourse conventions that shaped the narrative of my family's memory. After that, I want to delve into my own personal memories from, a different, from different stages at school. Uh, that point of view gives me a chance to examine and compare me my memories to some semi-public sources. In one chapter of the book, What is Microhistory, Theory and pra Practice, Sigurd Gilvi Magnusson, who co-authored co the book, discusses an interesting example of eco-documental research. In his riveting book, The File, Personal History, Timothy Garton Ash, professor of European Studies at Oxford University, examines files that the infamous East German secret police Stasi kept on him during his day in East Berlin as an exchange student. Garton Ash gets a unique opportunity to compare his memory to somewhat disturbing sources that documented his life without him knowing at the time. The result is an interesting and thought-provoking book that explores the nature of memory as a historical source. I intend to use similar, though not as dramatic, sources, produced by a third party without my direct knowledge of their production. For various reasons, I have kept many report cards and critiques on my academic performance throughout the past, throughout the past 18 years. These sources provide me with somewhat detailed third-party observations on my behavior and performance in school. Comparing these sources to my own recollection of memorable events in school could lead, me, could lead to some interesting conclusions. There is, however, one difficult question that haunts this research. That should we be burdening our past with contemporary ideas, knowledge and hindsight? Is it, for example, academically sound to use modern medical terms or, and tools to examine past events where perhaps those ideas did not exist or were understood in a different manner? Many scholars would find these methods objectionable, especially historians. One good example of a similar debate can be observed in stu studies on the Icelandic witch trials. Many scholars have studied an interesting account written by the priest Jón Magnusson, who lived in 1610 to 1696, who believed himself to have been bewitched by his neighbors. Some have tried to explain the illness he describes with modern medical terms. Jón Magnusson has been diagnosed with everything from schizophrenia to the common cold. Other scholars, like the late Matthias Vidar Simonsson, professor of Icelandic literature at the University of Iceland, have criticized the approach to be pure anachronism. That is to say, Matthias and others find it academically unsound to use modern scientific terms to describe conditions in the past. Using such methods is nothing short of fiction. This debate is part of a larger one that has been going on within the humanities for quite some time. The debate centers on how we should examine and interpret sources that are based on memory. Can we let go of contemporary discourse conventions when analyzing sources that connote different conventions that are perhaps lost to us? If indeed that were possible, would that even be, de be desirable? These are the key questions in the debate between historical and collective memory and how these phenomena coexist in modern Western culture. Scholars like Maurice Holbox and Pierre Nora assert that with the arrival of modernity, collective memory was supplanted by historical memory, that we have lost all connection to the past and rely upon historiography, which gives us only a distorted image of the past. Susan A. Crane, associate professor of modern European history at the University of Arizona, argues, however, that historical memory operates within the confines of collective memory and is in fact a type of expression of collective memory. She encourages scholars to admit to their presence in their historical narrative and discuss openly what influences their research. What makes this an interesting experiment is that I play all the major roles. I generate the primary sources, I examine them and put them into narrative form. I recognize that my memories have changed with the passing of time. My environment, a national and local culture has evolved. 
new cultural units and discourse convention have emerged. Of course, I have changed also and merged with some of these cultural units and adopted new ideas. Complexity increases with the passing of time. Respects the question, can we completely trust our memories?